Hello and welcome to today's edition of Ask the Expert. Um, we'll be speaking today with Liz Jackson and Lenny Farley about invasive plant species and how you can identify, remove, replace, um, and, and all the other things that you need to know uh, to make your yard a better place. Um, we will uh, be discussing um, some of the regulations and websites and other resources that you can use. And also we'll be taking your questions. So make sure to put those in the comment section um, on Facebook and we will get to those as we have time. So as I mentioned, Lenny is an extension forestry specialist for the Purdue Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. And Liz is the executive director of the Indiana Woodland Owners Association, as well as being an extension specialist. Um, so Lenny, let's start with you. What is an invasive species and why should I care? And how do I know if I have any? Great question, Wendy. Uh, an invasive species it is an exotic species, not native here, that is also out competing our native plant species. And so it has the capacity to spread into the natural environment and grow faster, produce more seed, and essentially uh, crowd out our native plants. And that's the problem, is that it starts degrading our natural habitats and replacing native plant communities with invasive plant communities. And in fact, Liz, on a little walk across her uh, neighborhood, picked up several invasives, and she's going to show us a few of those right now. Sure. Thanks, Lenny. Yes, I was... Um looking out at lunchtime and within two houses of my own, I found four different items. I found a bush honeysuckle sprout, um, a calorie pear tree, and a sweet autumn clematis and a burning bush. Now, two of these were planted by my neighbors. So that's one of the problems we have with invasive species is they're commonly planted in the landscape and then accidentally in, and unintentionally spread. But two of these were sprouts, which had sprouted up from seed and plants which had spread through invasion. One of the things to consider with invasive species is how to prevent them on your property. And um, uh, one way of preventing is to make sure in, in a neighborhood is to, is to mow and keep your, your property clean from that kind of thing. But often they invade in the natural areas where uh, you can't control through mowing or other means. So one, uh, there's a, several methods of prevention, and there's a website called playcleango.org. I have a hard time saying that. Uh, Play Clean Go gives you ideas for how to minimize the spread of invasive species on your property, and they have a lot of great tips. Um, for example, you need to clean your boots whenever you use a trail uh, as you leave the property because you're going to spread seed and other things around on your boots. You need to clean your tools, your mowers, um, even think about your dogs, the collar and the coat need to be cleaned. And so those are the kind of things that you can do to help reduce the spread from your property to, or trails that you go on to other properties. Um, the, another website is um, um, called uh, Best Management Practices for Invasive Species, and you can find that at the Indiana Invasive Species Council website, which is a great doorway site to all kinds of information. And there they have like top 10 tips for preventing invasive species. So I definitely suggest that as a place to go to find a lot of prevention and other activities. Um, Lenny, would you like to talk about other places that you can get assistance? Yeah, there's a variety of ways we can find out how to identify invasive plants. Liz gave a couple of really good ones. Uh, there's also a, a phone app that you can tap into through the uh, Invasive Species Council site. Uh, it's uh, uh, the uh, Great Lakes Early Detection Network that provides this, and it has some great identification uh, tools on it as well as reporting tools, and so you can actually uh, run into a plant out in the landscape that you don't recognize. You can look through the list of plants they've got, and if you find and can identify that plant, you can actually report it so that we have an idea where these plants are spreading. If you want to think about controlling these plants on your property, and particularly if you've got a rural property, uh, a farm, uh, woodlands, uh, wildlife habitat areas, there's actually cost sharing assistance that you can tap into in some cases from the USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service. I've actually used this on my own property. 
And so it's an opportunity to get some assistance to make sure your wildlife habitats and forests are healthy by eliminating and controlling and managing the invasive species that grow there. There are also private consulting foresters and uh, invasive species control contractors that you can get in touch with if the job is just too big for you to do or you're needing help assessing what kind of issues you've got on your property with invasive species. So lots of places you can go to get assistance with the management of your property. Great, that's an awesome introduction for those of us who aren't familiar with invasive species. Now, Liz, one of the plants that you mentioned um, is that burning bush. And I know my mother has one and she loves it. Um, why should people care that certain plants are on the invasive list and how are they really affecting um, the environment if they just look so darn pretty? Well, that's a good question. Um, the native plants have a few, or the, the invasive plants have a few problems. One is that they're highly aggressive and they tend to take over in natural areas. They often are heavy seeders. They often leaf out before and last longer than native plants. So that causes them to uh, create situations where they can take over and outcompete our native plants. Um, and birds like to carry them around and drop the seed in different places. So they'll end up establishing in areas where we don't, we don't want them. So your, your mother may be happy with her burning bush in her yard, but little does she know that the seed from that burning bush could be deposited in woods quite a ways away from her house. Um, the other thing about um, invasive plants is they're not the best food sources generally for pollinators and birds. And our native plants do a much better job of, of feeding and, and providing the correct environments for insects and other pollinators. So that's the main reason that we, we prefer that people remove them from the landscape. Now, if you want to um, find sources of alternate species, we have a couple of great resources for you. Uh, Purdue has an extension publication, Alternative Plants for Landscaping, and that will allow you to have some ideas on what you can sub for those invasive plants you might have on your property. Um, the Indiana Native Plant Society is also a great resource. They provide um, events and um, programs about native plants and opportunities to find out more about them, as well as a website where you can learn where to get native plants. Great, thanks Liz. Um, Lenny, a question for you. We have our first question of the day um, from the audience. What is the best way to eliminate large numbers of Asian bush honeysuckle? Yeah, that's a, a common invasive shrub here uh, where I live in Tippecanoe New County and around Indiana. And the, the answer really is you need to evaluate the extent of the infestation and the size of the plants. And so small Asian bush honeysuckle is actually pretty easy to hand pull, uh, particularly if the soil is moist in the spring or after a rain. Uh, those small plants are pretty easy to pull. I just pull them out of the ground and get the root system up in the air where it's gonna dry out and not re-root. For larger plants, we've got a couple of different options. We can cut that plant off above ground and spray an herbicide on that cut stump. And this time of year going into fall uh, is a pretty good time to do that. Uh, some of the herbicides that we would typically use and probably one of the easiest ones for a landowner to use is glyphosate concentrate, which you can get at almost any of the uh, farm or nursery stores, and mix that concentrate with 50% water, spray it on that cut stump right after you've cut the stump. You don't want to wait around because that stump can actually seal. Another option is using that same glyphosate, but mixing it with water to make about a 3 to 4% solution of the concentrate in water, and spray the foliage of that plant from about now clear into fall before the leaves start changing color. All of those are very effective techniques at controlling Asian bush honeysuckle. Uh, but an important point is that you're not done after one year. We invariably will miss some plants and also we'll have some seed germinate over the next two to three years. And so you do your initial treatment and then come back for a couple of years at least to do follow-up treatments and then monitor after that because unfortunately the birds are also always bringing in new seed for you in most cases. Those darn birds, they're just not so helpful sometimes. Um, Liz, back to you, um, just wanted to talk to you. There's 
a thing a lot of people may not have heard of called the terrestrial plant rule. Um, can you share a little bit about that with us and, and what that means for me in terms of what I can and should be planting? Sure, the terrestrial plant rule came out this April and became official. I'm gonna share some information on that. So um, the Department of Entomology and Plant Pathology with the D Department of Natural Resources is the lead organization on this. And this is um, a legal requirement now that a number of over 44 native or invasive plant species can no longer be sold in the landscape trade, meaning that you can't go to a store and purchase these anymore. This was a big win for um, the woodland owners and uh, natural areas communities because before that, many of these invasive plants were being sold out in your landscape nursery. So it was just making the problem worse. So they've created a flyer. You can find it on the um, DNR website or just Google Indiana Terrestrial Plant Rule. And this flyer tells you a little bit about the rule. Again, it went into effect in April and um, what to do if you have questions. Now, if you find that some of these uh, plants are being sold, they ask you to contact the Department of Entomology and tell them about that so they can follow up with the nursery and make sure that those are not sold. Now, on the next page is a list of the species. Um, these are kind of small, but there's 44 species that can no longer be sold or traded. And there's two uh, specifically of interest uh, right now that are often um, sold in landscape nurseries. The first is Japanese barberry. It's a small reddish purple plant that many people have in their landscape and that can no longer be sold. And then the second is winter creeper, which is a dark green vine. And so um, getting those out of trade and no longer being able to be distributed is a, is a great coup for us. Well, Liz, let's um, let Lenny address the elephant in the room here. Um, there's one tree where I know we're talking about plants today that is not on that list. Uh, Lenny, can you fill us in about what I think is a really pretty tree that is um, not on that list? Uh, can you fill us in on what that is? Yeah, a calorie pear uh, is a, uh, a species and one of the most common ornamental varieties is Bradford pear. It's been planted for many years and there's no question it's a beautiful tree. Uh, wonderful white blooms in great abundance early in the spring, uh, really pretty glossy leaves through the growing season and then the fall it's got really nice fall color that, that holds on really late into the fall. The problem is that the original cultivar Bradford pear was sterile, which was good. The, the birds could eat the seed but it wasn't spreading it across the landscape, but it had a bad branching form would fall apart with age. They created additional cultivars that had better form but once these cultivars cross pollinate with the old Bradford, those seeds are now fertile. And so when birds eat the seed, they scatter that seed around the landscape and these new hybrids uh, grow very rapidly uh, and can occupy large areas. And if you're driving in roadways in many places in Indiana in the spring, you're gonna notice these pillars of white early in the spring and that's new calorie pear growing up in those right of ways and waste areas where the birds have planted the seed. So we're really trying to put a big education effort out to not plant this tree anymore. It didn't make the original restricted list because there was so much of the tree in trade. And so the impact uh, economically for the landscape nursery was gonna be so high that what they wanted to do is keep it off the list to start an education program to have people start not planting that tree, have the industry have an opportunity to work down their inventory and we're very hopeful that that tree would be added to the list in the future and through education, people would stop planting it, remove the ones they have and replace them with great natives. Things like uh, Juneberry, crab apples, dogwoods that still provide wonderful blooms, great benefits, but are native and non-invasive. So for all those wondering, it is in the works. It's an education program. Um, and, and there were some great options that, Le that Lenny gave you um, there as well. Liz, I wanna throw it back to you a little bit. And we talked a little bit about what's in bloom right now, um, what's leafed out, but how do I know when to look for what items? Is there kind of a, a calendar I can follow that gives me some tips on, on when I should look for what species? 
Um, there is a calendar for controlling species, and I'd like to share that with you if I might. This was created by the Brown County Native Woodlands Project. It's a, a, a county group that works on controlling invasive species. And each species has um, a prime time for effective control of it. Sometimes it's because of its growth characteristics and other times there's some seasonality reasons. So this product is um, on, on their website and I believe Wendy's gonna give you a link to that. On the right hand, on the left hand side, it has a list of the invasive species. The first one is a group of shrubs like autumn olive. And then in the calendar in the middle, it has the months of the year and describes what months are most effective for treating that. So for example, the first one, autumn olive, it suggests that from July to September, doing a foliar spray is the best and most efficient method of controlling autumn olive. Now, each of these is color coded and at the bottom, there's a key to what kind of treatments they're recommending under each of these conditions. What you'll find is that if you um, do your control outside of these windows, you may be effective, but your effectiveness may be reduced. And so um, going with something that gives you this kind of information can be helpful to be effective the first time you treat and not have to go back multiple times. It's very helpful information there, Liz. Um, just wanted to throw it to you, Lenny. What should we be looking for right now? Um, what What is out there? I know some things are leafing out, some things are flowering. Um, just what are some of the, the current events, if you will, in the world of in, invasive plant species? Yeah, everything is greened up significantly now that we're in June. And so, in fact, the best times to, to scout for invasives, uh, invasives are in the early spring because they often leaf out quicker than our natives and then in the fall because they often hold their leaves longer than our natives. But one species in particular that we've already talked about is very prominent right now and that's Asian bush honeysuckle. And that's because it is blooming uh, uh, significantly at this point in time. And it's got little uh, admittedly attractive white and yellowish tubular flowers on the plants uh, and so it shows up really well in the landscape right now. And it's a really common one in our forest understories along our roadside. So it's one that landowners are probably gonna pick up on at this point in time uh, pretty significantly. And then for the others, it can be a little more challenging because everything's just kind of blending together with those green colors out there. And we've got the lushness of summer. Uh, so if you're having trouble finding some of the species, you can always kind of delay until later in the summer and fall when some of our natives will be fading out, but those uh, invasives oftentimes are staying green and you can really pick them up uh, very well. And some of the species you'll find like that are things like calorie pear, uh, the privets, Asian bush honeysuckle, uh, the oriental bittersweets. Those are all species that will have a tendency to hang on to their leaves later in the fall than all our natives. One of our audience members has shared about um, SICIM, um, which has a lot of great resources that you can reach out to your regional specialists and have help in identifying and managing those things. Liz, can you share a little bit about that and maybe some of the other organizations people can utilize um, if they need help? Sure, I'm glad SICM came up. That was one thing that we wanted to talk to, about today. SICM has amazing resources. It stands for the Southern Indiana Cooperative Invasive Management. And it's a, an organization who is helping to manage invasive species originally in the Southern third of the state. But since then, they have partnered with the Natural Resources Conservation Service and created a program called the Indiana in 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 Invasives Initiative, which is a five-year program to coordinate and work together to um, provide resources and assistance for in landowners on invasive species. And their ultimate goal is to create county SISMAs all over the state, um, approximately 60 is their goal. So they provide local assistance to people and opportunities to work on controlling invasives in your own county. And I'd like to share a little bit more about the SISMAs. SISMA stands for Cooperative Invasive Species Management Area. 
And so it's a name for a county group who is working to coordinate invasive species control and management and education in their local area. And this initiative has, uh, they put together a map and this is on the Sikkim website. Uh, the blue counties are those who are formed and active SISMAs. And I definitely recommend you consider reaching out to your county if they have an active group. Generally, they're putting on education programs. They're doing control programs on with volunteers on private on public lands, as well as many of them are offering assessments and walkthroughs on public land from private lands. So you can um, get assistance on your own property. Um, you can go to education programs and learn about ID and control and other things like that. The green um, counties are those that are future that they hope to establish SISMAs in, uh, don't yet have an organization. Um, if you live in one of those counties, I suggest you reach out to Sikkim. They can still connect you with resources because they have resource specialists located all over the state. And the orange counties are organizing right now. Uh, many of them are, are just getting started, but for the most part, they have at least met and are beginning to get resources available for local assistance. So it's a great resource. I definitely recommend you talk to your locals, uh, CISMA, because they do have the latest, greatest news about what's going on in your area and will work with you to help control in your property. Thanks, Liz. Um, a lot of fans of Sikkim out there um, watching today. So um, certainly we're thrilled to have resources across um, the state that are contributing to this in, in addition to your local um, extension uh, personnel, they can help you within your county as well. Um, one thing I wanna mention, Liz, there is a conference um, for some of those folks that are really, really interested in CISMA and some of those type of things coming up, hopefully, um, crossing our fingers um, that COVID allows it. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that conference and, and if people are interested, what can they expect from that? Sure. That conference is rescheduled from March to August 20th in Noblesville. And you can go on the Sikkim website to get information on uh, registering for that conference. They're going to talk about the partnerships around the state. They're going to talk about emerging issues in invasive species. They're going to talk about control methods. I believe Lenny is uh, speaking at it. And it's an opportunity to meet with people across the state and learn more about what's going on with invasive species. And I do hope that conference does go on because it will be a great opportunity. I, uh, I'll break in here. I just got noticed a little while ago that that conference is gonna be continuing but virtual. And so they can still register for it and they'll be able to access the uh, presentations uh, in an online format. Even better, you don't have to leave your house. You can you watch the video and go out and pull some weeds. Um, <laughs> uh, Lenny, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, we talked about identifying um, invasive species, but what do I do if I have some of those invasive species? Can you talk about maybe the control factor or the management? And then, then we can talk a little bit more a little bit later about um, what to do to replace those things. So let's start with, with what do I do if I have them? Yeah, that's, that's a, one of the big important points is we start with ID, but then we need to take action to make some differences on this. And so I'm going to share my screen also and uh, show you some control tools that you can use that hopefully will uh, give you some options. And so in some cases, we've got a situation where we have a really heavy infestation and it's obvious it's gonna be kind of beyond your capacity to do much about it. And in those situations, you may want to look at trying to find a, a, a contractor. Folks like Sikkim can help you with that, the private consulting foresters, the invasive species contractors who will oftentimes have uh, power equipment they can utilize to rapidly deal with infestations. And so on the top of this picture, we've got a grasper on a, a skid steer loader that can pull plants out of the ground, uh, large size. Uh, on the upper right, we have a, a grinder head that essentially mulches up invasive species, getting them down to ground line. Uh, from there, they'll re-sprout and they can be easily foliar sprayed with herbicides to kill them. Uh, some folks that don't want to use herbicide, but they've got plants that are too large for them to manually pull. Uh, there are mechanical levers that you can purchase or, or make yourself to help be able to pop these root systems out of the ground with a little bit of help from that lever. 
get some bigger plants out. Uh, a lot of folks own a chainsaw and that's a great way to cut the stems off and then treat the stumps with herbicide. But one of my favorite tools is actually what we call a, a, a brush saw. And this is a, a little higher horsepower weed eater style piece of equipment uh, with a tricycle handle and you can put a cutter head on it. And I find it to be a very safe and very effective tool for cutting off both vines and shrubs that I want to eliminate. And I'm just able to work a longer day with these because uh, I don't have to bend over. And I'm also at much lower risk of cutting myself than I would be with a chainsaw. And then if you're more into hand tools, I've got several here that I utilize on a regular basis. So for tree size material, a lot of times I'll do a girdling cut all the way around the stem and put herbicide in it to kill that tree. For shrubs and brush, I can use the, the cutting hook, the handsaw or the machete, and then apply herbicide to those cut stumps. And so all those techniques are very effective at controlling invasives. And then finally, uh, we've talked about spraying stumps or spraying foliage with herbicide. And there's a variety of small or medium sized spray bottle pieces of equipment you can get for reasonable prices, a little pump hand sprayers, squirt bottles or backpack sprayers, and all those are very effective for invasive species control. But you'll notice what we're typically doing is combining a cutting with also an application of herbicide. The cutting eliminates a lot of that biomass, uh, knocks the plant back, and then we essentially give it the, the killing shot by putting herbicide on or in that cut that then kills the root system and prevents the re-sprouting. If we just cut these plants, typically we've just all only made them mad and they're going to sprout back and grow all the faster. And so combining that cutting with herbicide application is a really big advantage to control. And as we mentioned, one of the best herbicides to use and one of the most available for most landowners is uh, glyphosate. And you can use the concentrate uh, mixed with about 50% water for stump applications and foliar applications. We're usually using two to 4% of the concentrate in the balanced water. So Lenny, you just walked right into the next question. What if I have um, animals or children or things I'm worried about using some of these herbicides? Um, what other options do I have? You mentioned, you know, cutting them or pulling them, but you also said to treat them. So what options do I have that may not be as dangerous to plants or animals or people? Absolutely. If you're concerned about application of herbicide because of a, a lack of control uh, of who's accessing that area or what's accessing that area. Probably your mechanical approaches of pulling or repeated cuttings are some of your best choices. And so if you can get the root system out of the ground, in many cases you've controlled that plant. If you can't get the root system out, uh, then what you'd want to do is continually cut on that plant as it re-sprouts. And ultimately, I think what you're going to be able to do is weaken the plant to the point where it doesn't present much of a risk. So if it's an area you regularly mow, or have the capacity to mow, cut it off, continue to mow over those sprouts, and you're essentially going to control that plant through time. One of the questions we had, Liz, is what should I plant if I, I get rid of the ones I have um, that are invasives. What do I put in their place? Um, and does it matter? I mean, I want the pretty things. Um, and I like the little flowers that Asian bush honeysuckle has or things like that. Um, where, where do I go from there? Well, that's a good question. Obviously, you, uh, there's a reason that people purchase the landscape plants. The things like burning bush look excellent in the fall. They're bright red and many plants have beautiful flowers. So that's why people have tended to move to them. But we do have quite a few native plants, which can give you the same look as the plants that you may have in your landscape now. A few um, native shrubs that are just absolutely beautiful, I have a nine bark outside my window right now that looks gorgeous, are viburnums and hydrangeas. Uh, Lenny mentioned dogwoods earlier. There's some shrub dogwoods as well as some dogwoods that are more of a tree form. Uh, chokeberry and winterberry. All of these are available at the website growindiananatives.org. You can learn about substitutes. 
And as I mentioned before, there's an, uh, a Purdue Extension publication, Alternative Ideas for Landscape Plants. So um, there are many that, that are quite similar that you could do as substitutes. And Lenny, throwing it back to you, you mentioned this a little bit earlier, but it's frustrating every year. I pulled all these, we, I pulled all these terrible plants and they still came back. Um, are there animals that are spreading this? Are there other things that are causing my work to go in vain? Yes, it is the frustration of invasive species controllers that your job is never done. Uh, it's definitely a long-term relationship <laughs> with these plants on the landscape. And the reason being, one of the reasons these plants are invasive is that they oftentimes produce a lot of seed. And that seed is distributed oftentimes by wildlife, in many cases, birds, but in some cases like uh, Tree of Heaven or Atlantis, also wind. And so we can't control what's coming from other people's properties onto ours. And so the goal oftentimes is to get the invasive species eliminated as much as possible on our property and then do a regular monitoring to keep that situation under control. That's been my constant job on my property. Uh, but I will say it's a good excuse to have a walk in the woods, particularly in the fall and the spring when these things are easy to see. But yeah, I'm afraid the story is you are never quite done unless you can convince uh, the bigger landscape, the, the neighbors, to really work that over too. And that's one of the things we're working on is, is uh, making sure that we're not intentionally putting these things in for landscaping. The rules are helping against that. But as we mentioned, there are still some plants like Calorie Repair that are available. Uh, and so that education and talking back and forth with your neighbors, agreeing to control maybe across the line and, and do a community-wide work on that can help that situation. Liz, are there things that I can do, um, like such as, I know there's campaigns for don't bring firewood in and, and watch out for some of these invasive animals and, and other um, diseases that can affect some of these Plants. So when we talk about invasive species, we're not just talking about plants like calorie pear or things like that. What else should we be looking for that can affect um, our woodlands and our, our native environments? That's a good question. No, it's far beyond terrestrial plants. We tend to, Lenny and I tend to work in that realm because those are the biggest invaders that we're seeing on a daily basis in our woodlands. But in fact, there are invasive pests and diseases as well that are, have wreaked havoc. One example that everybody knows is emerald ash borer. Um, we have a website at Purdue called Report Invasive, and it's an excellent resource for all, any number of invasive species far beyond terrestrial plants. And at that site, um, there's a learn section where you can learn about IDing and the different pests that we have in Indiana and how they're impacting us. Um, there's all kinds of videos and fact sheets on how to ID a number of species, um, a lot of insects on there. And um, the Purdue Forestry Extension website also has a number of ID videos and fact sheets, as well as the Sikkim website that was recently mentioned. Just a reminder for those of you following along, if you have questions, um, please put those in the comments and, and Liz and Lenny would be happy to answer those. Um, also, just a clarification, it's growindiananatives.org. Um, I had typed it in as .com, so apologies to those of you who went and couldn't find the proper website. Um, slip of the fingers there. Um, but let's talk a little bit about um, some of the other resources that are available to people. Um, if they need contractors or there's maybe some programs that can help them um, with habitats in their areas. Lenny, can you fill us in on I know we talked about the Sikkim website, but what about some of the others? Yeah, let me uh, actually, I'll bring up some more information here. So Oh, I'm sorry, I've got the wrong one. Let me go back. Always interesting when you've got more than one screen open. So we mentioned the Indiana Invasive Species Council. I find that to be one of the best clearinghouses 
for information in general. You can access almost anything else I'm going to talk about here from there. And so it's a great starting point. If you're interested in looking at both ID and also control techniques, the Midwest Invasive Plant Network site uh, has good ID resources, but one of the best uh, control databases that I've found. It does a really nice job of not only going through the different control techniques, but also rating them. And what you'll find is there are some species out there that are just flat hard to control. Uh, nothing does a perfect job. And that kind of goes back to that issue of where we're gonna have to think about this as a, a repeated treatment where one, one job one year is not gonna do the job. We're gonna have to come back and continue working on these things. And then another resource that I will occasionally send people to, and it's a fee resource, but it's an excellent one. If you're not getting the, the answers you need uh, someplace else in terms of identification or disease issues, the uh, Purdue Plant Pest Diagnostic Lab can run either physical samples or even high quality photos to give you ID assistance. And they're typically charging for that service, but they do a, a wonderful job and provide high accuracy on the responses that you get. Uh, so those are, are great resources to tap into. The other folks that if you are a rural landowner with uh, a larger acreage, a farm, uh, forest lands that you manage, wildlife habitat areas, there is that cost sharing uh, for invasive species control. It's available through the USDA cost assistance programs. And they also provide uh, cost sharing for things like tree and shrub planting and wildlife habitat enhancement and improvement. And that may be an important practice after you've done your invasive species control to put desirable plants back into the places where we've taken out the undesirable plants. Uh, so all of those are, are good avenues to, to look at depending on your particular situation. So one of the things that we've been asked is, what are some of the ways that I can prevent invasive species from even getting started on my property? Can, is there anything I can do to save myself the heartache and trouble? Sure, I can talk about that. Um, the Indiana Invasive Species Council, which Lenny just mentioned them, has a website and on it they have the top 10 best management practices for controlling invasive species on your property. And I mentioned earlier uh, the prevention idea of keeping all of your materials clean. You should clean your boots, your clothing, your dog, your tools, your mowers, your vehicles, anything that can uh, that seeds or pieces of plant material can hitchhike on um, should be um, brushed or removed or washed as you leave the property or before you go on to a different property, uh, public or private. Um, it's amazing what can hitchhike. And this is especially important as seeding time comes. Different plants seed at different times. You're a little safer in the winter. You're not as likely to, to carry seed around. But, but in those times of year when seed is moving, uh, for example, Japanese stiltgrass seeds in August, September timeframe. And if you'll walk through an area with stiltgrass and then move to another area, you'll often find stiltgrass along most any trail in the state. And that's because it's been brought in on boots probably. Um, another way to uh, practice good, good, safe practices and prevention is to have a monitoring and plan for your property. Um, as Lenny mentioned, uh, the seed stays in the soil and can re-sprout for years and years. And this is, a, this is never a done deal. So it's important that you have a plan for at least on a regular basis, walking your property and watching for those areas that you know an infestation could get started. And um, often those are corridors like roads or trails or play or even along a deer path could be a place. So map your current infestation. Keep a journal of what you control and when and how, because that can help you recognize where you've been efficient and uh, watch for inefficiencies or places where you weren't, uh, I should say efficacies and watch where you weren't as effective. And then also have a plan to go back on a semi-regular basis and check those areas. Always thinking about um, the future and when you're going to need to control. By golly, this is way easier to do when you see three plants than when you see 300. So recognizing those three plants and getting those pulled and out of the system is a great way to keep things at bay for sure. 
Lenny, as we wrap things up here today, um, what else would you like to mention to people as they begin to tackle this invasive species issue? Um, any resources or any just tips and maybe how to manage the frustration um, from the uh, constant work that you do? And, and this is a field you deal with every day. Yeah, having my own property that uh, had a major invasive species problem and having to work across that, what I would say is that you, you, like so many things, we have to eat the elephant a little bit at a time. And I've got kind of a prioritization approach that I take with invasive species, and that is that I work on eliminating seed producers as quickly as I can, because that's what's feeding uh, the, the bulk of the material that's growing new on your property. So if you can eliminate the seed producers, the bigger plants, you're ahead of the game there. And then I also start working in areas that have the lowest levels of infestation. And that's partly a psychological thing. I want to try to get some victories. Uh, places where I see that I've actually eliminated the invasive species and I see native plants coming back or space for them. And so uh, that's kind of my dual pronged approach to start an invasive species project. And then the other thing I try to do is I try to remind myself that I'm working toward uh, an improved situation. And what I'm gonna be able to do if I stay at this and find some satisfaction in the fact that I'm, I'm making that progress, I'm gonna have a better property in the future. So I'm gonna have better quality wildlife habitat. I'm gonna see more wildflowers. I'm gonna see more native plants. Uh, and as I work on that, the number of invasive pests out there, the number of invasive plants gradually diminishes, and I'm hopefully able to get on top of that issue. That being said, I do have a couple of plants that I fight with constantly, uh, and garlic mustard is one of the worst. It's a very hard plant to get on top of because it stores seed in the soil and produces so many seeds every year, and it's a biennial, and so it's turning over really rapidly. So I think I would tell people, pick your battles. Uh, find a place that's your favorite spot on the property, a great wildflower spot. Start working there and take your victories as you can find them. Sounds like great ideas there and, and great advice on how do you uh, manage the frustration of invasive species. It's a battle we're all fighting. Um, and if you have any further questions, feel free to put those in our comment section and Liz and Lenny will answer those after the fact. Um, want to get you to mark your calendar for next week um, at 3 p.m. on Thursday. We'll be talking about coexisting with coyotes. Um, that will be put on by Brian McGowan and um, one of our graduate students, um, B. Overby. Uh, so if you have questions about coyotes, uh, keep your eyes open for the promotional videos and things for that topic, and we'll take your questions and uh, talk about that next week. So thanks, Liz and Lenny. Um, appreciate the help, and may we all win the battle against the invasives.